Bueno, de nuevo, buenas tardes. Toca clausurar este simposio. Eh, y antes de, de pasar la palabra a Alberto, pues me gustaría felicitar a Funseam por todo lo que está haciendo, a Maite, a Juan, etcétera, a todos los que trabajan pues, por mantener este diálogo y esta reflexión continua sobre un momento muy importante en el sector energético como es la transición. Deciros que tenía pues, muchas ideas para trasladaros. Están todas expuestas, como no podía ser de otra forma, por yo soy Johnny Maz, eh, y con las cuales coincido plenamente. Y al mismo tiempo felicitarme, porque yo creo que el nivel de lo que he escuchado hoy ha sido muy alto. Me parece que el ministro nos ha puesto, nuestro ministro de Energía nos ha puesto un, un nivel alto eh, en pragmatismo, en, eh, en falta de ideología en cuanto a que los temas de la transición energética tienen que ser temas tratados desde un punto de vista científico y pragmático y empresarial y no desde un punto de vista ideológico. A mí me parece que el ministro nos ha dado una, un ejemplo de cómo hay que hacer política haciendo empresa eh, y, por tanto, me felicito mm, deciros que… Mm, yo, si tuviese que resumir lo que he escuchado aquí, hay tres cosas, ¿no? Una es tecnología, la otra es talento de las personas y la otra que esto es responsabilidad de todos, de la sociedad civil y de las empresas, que no debemos confrontarnos. Aquí hay espacio para todas las energías, hay tiempo para que todas las energías evolucionen. Al final, como decía Joe Sujón, las líneas se nos irán difuminando y acabaremos todos haciendo lo mismo y, por tanto, pues durante este camino pues eh, seamos todos constructivos, pensemos que la ecuación coste-beneficio nunca debe abandonar nuestros principios básicos empresariales y, por tanto, centrémonos y focalicémonos en hacer las cosas bien en un sector que, como todos ya se ha dicho aquí muchas veces, va a estar en cambio. ¿no? Pero lo importante no son mis palabras, eh, sino las que nos puede decir Alberto Potochnik, eh, como director de la Agencia Europea para la Cooperación de los Reguladores Energéticos, la conocida ACER. ¿no? ACER, como sabéis, se, se configura como una entidad central independiente a la que compete el seguimiento de la cooperación regional entre los gestores de la red de transporte de gas y electricidad. Cuestiones básicas como la supervisión de los mercados interiores de la electricidad y el gas natural, la, la elaboración de las directrices marco para los códigos de red, entre otras muchas, configuran la agenda de trabajo de la nueva agencia. Pero también, en palabras de su director, la agencia contribuye a una mayor implicación de los ciudadanos europeos en todos los aspectos de la transición energética, aspecto, insisto, enormemente importante, involucrando, por tanto, a las organizaciones de consumidores en el desarrollo general del marco regulatorio. Eh, aunque no hace falta presentaciones, déjenme hacer una breve reseña de su excelente trayectoria profesional. Alberto Potochnik es economista y experto en econometría y, como bien conocen ustedes, director de la Agencia Europea para la Cooperación de los Reguladores de la Energía desde su creación. Antes de incorporarse a la agencia, fue socio en Mercados EMI, una consultora internacional especializada en el sector energético, donde fue consejero delegado y vicepresidente. Anteriormente se desempeñó como director de regulación de la electricidad en la Autoridad Reguladora de la Energía, como primer CEO del operador italiano del mercado de la electricidad y como asesor del gobierno italiano. Desde el 2004 es consejero en la Escuela de Regulación de Florencia, donde enseña regularmente sobre regulación energética. Es sin duda un gran conocedor del sector y de los retos a los que se enfrenta. Alberto, una vez más, muchas gracias por aceptar la invitación a participar en este acto de clausura y tienes la palabra. Thank you very much and uh, apologies for uh, speaking in English, uh, but I'm acutely aware that I'm the last one between you and your evening, so I will try not to be too long. First of all, I would like to thank Funsem and uh, Maria Teresa for the uh, kind invitation. It's always a pleasure to join your initiative, your events. Um, I will be obviously talking about the challenges uh, facing the uh, energy sector, and have, with, with, with a view to the winter package, I would probably focus a bit more on the electricity sector, but there are also reflections on, on, on the gas sector. And I would like to start from where Christopher Jones left it this morning, because he said um, at some stage, you know, the, the policy background, the energy policy background has not changed a lot over the last 10 years. And I, I, I completely agree, and I think um, the energy union strategy and also this winter package have always have all been sort of part of the same path, trying to um, 
try to pursue uh, the three objectives, the three pillars of um, uh, energy policy since the mid um, of the, uh, the middle of the last of the, of the last decade. So we have competitiveness or efficiency. We have sustainability. We have secure supply. I think we all know about this because we've heard about this for the last ten years. What has happened in the meanwhile is um, that the way in which uh, we are pursuing these objectives has changed and is creating additional challenges. And most of what we are addressing at the moment is directly or indirectly related to the greater penetration of renewables in the system, which is good in its own right, but it also creates challenges. Um, um, regulators, in a couple of years ago, we, 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 we developed a reflection uh, for which we involved all stakeholders. We went to consultation twice on what are the trends, the emerging trends in, um, in the energy sector for the next 10 years and what are the appropriate um, regulatory responses. And I think it was pretty obvious that everybody agreed that this was the single greatest challenge um, determining the way and shaping the way for the, uh, for the energy sector. Um, I think we've heard already this morning you know, um, that the new renewables are more variable, we can call it in intermittent, or um, than, than traditional generation, and therefore we need to have a more flexible electricity system in order to absorb these renewables. So this is a bit the challenge. But then we also have opportunities, opportunities mostly delivered by the progress in the digital agenda, in the technology. And we have the opportunity of involving consumers more directly uh, in, uh, in the liberalization and in the restructuring of the energy sectors. Until now, consumers have been the supposed beneficiaries of liberalization. I mean, the whole process since the first directive has been uh, developed on, in order to deliver benefits to consumers in, in, in terms of better prices, more choice, etc. And yet, just this is just an, as an aside, we haven't yet been able to deliver that to consumers, or at least to excite consumers to the extent that they reap these benefits. I mean, there's still the average switching rate in Europe is still 6% per, per year, which means that on average it takes 16 years for each of us um, to, um, to switch. Now, is this uh, too long or too short a period? I don't know, but I'm sure that in other sectors we, see, we switch supply much more often. So we still have, there is still work to do there, but now consumers, um, large and small, have a, an additional role to play, which is not just to take benefit, but also to create value and to add uh, to, to, um, to, to help the energy sector become more, uh, more flexible. And, um, and this is an opportunity, obviously, that we need to deliver to consumers through, as I said, smart technologies, smart grids, smart meters, but also probably new business models. We need also to develop the regulatory framework that facilitate the entry into the market of so-called aggregators in, in various shapes and forms. Uh, we need, but we need to have you know, a, a, a proper business model for them. And unfortunately, one of the aspects of the, of the winter package, which for, for, for us may require some enhancement, is exactly the business model which is outlined them there for, for, for aggregators. But um, so the, 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 the response of the Commission with the winter package with the energy union was twofold. On the one hand, to try to promote, among others, a more flexible system, and the other, the other hand, to um, provide a new deal to consumers in terms of reaping the benefits and creating the value. Um, so in, 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 in discussing a bit or in sharing uh, my some reflection I have on the, on the winter package, I will take, from the, take it from the perspective of the agency. So um, what I, I'm going to do is to, to, I'm going to present what we believe the winter package is providing, uh, is, is giving to the agency in terms of additional role. And most of these um, additional responsibilities are actually linked to additional element uh, in the framework established by the winter package to try to create a more European approach to market design and to system operation. Now, but before doing that, um, maybe if I'm talking about new roles for the agency, perhaps I should spend two or three minutes um, presenting what is the current role of the agency. May I just ask a question? How many here um, today are familiar with what the agency is and does? Okay. 
so I will go quickly, but perhaps just to remind ourselves, is we are not a European regulator. And I think there was a discussion in the running up, of, uh, running up to the winter package whether we should have, Europe should have a, a, a European regulator. My answer is clearly no. But there are aspects of regulation where, where we require a European-wide approach. So when it comes to retail markets, we're not yet there with a European-wide retail market. And consumers in Spain, I'm sure they're much happier to talk to a Spanish regulator rather than call 00386, which is the international dialing code for Ljubljana. Uh, but when it comes to wholesale markets or horizontal network, then I think we need, if not a European regulator, we, we need a clear European framework for regulation. Uh, what we do, so far we've been mostly given um, powers to issue opinions and recommendations and only in, in, in some specific cases decisions and decisions only when national regulatory authorities were responsible for taking this decision cannot agree. And this is already quite a reinforcement or at least it's trying to fill the regulatory gap that emerged when trying to integrate the uh, um, energy market in the face of national competencies and national jurisdictions of national regulators. So if they have to agree and they can't agree, then what happens? When in this case, the issue comes um, to the agency. Um, we are tasked with, um, with, with a number of activities from uh, um, those in the infrastructure area to those um, related to the development of network code and framework guides and network codes. We also monitor the market, both the development in the market and also development of trading. And since 2011, we've been given additional responsibility in monitoring the trading on wholesale energy uh, markets. But we also monitor every year on a continuous basis, monitor development in the market just to try, just to, to try identifying whether there are still barriers to the integration of markets. And i just give you an example of um, what we found and how we reacted to it. Um, I think we've, um, I think the minister this morning, in providing his, how can you say, skeptical approach to response to the winter package, whatever it was, uh, down to earth, down to earth, I think, uh, response to the winter package, I said, you know, there is no point in trying to integrate the internal market if we don't have interconnections. Okay, we, in fact, in, on, on many boards, we, we, we are missing the, phys, the, the, the adequate physical capacity. But then we looked at how much of the physical capacity is actually used for trading. And what is surprising is that for AC connections, which is the typical um, technology for connection in, 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 in continental Europe, on average, only 28% of the physical capacity, the thermal capacity, is used. It's made available, not used, sorry, made available for trading. Now, Obviously, in Ljubljana, we are not naive enough to, to believe that we should aim at 100%. There are good reasons um, why you cannot allocate for trading 100%. But 28% is low on all accounts. And then if you look at you know, regions, there are regions where this number is below 20%. So there is more that can be done with the current infrastructure even before we start spending euros in new infrastructure. And the reason for this limited uh, use of the existing interconnector has to do with the uh, historic basis on which uh, capacity calculation was performed, where the um, cross-border interconnectors were the residual variable in the operational security equation. So operational security was maintained not by set limits on internal and cross-border infrastructure as it would be optimal, but just um, pushing, if you want, congestion to the border, or pushing um, uh, um, capacity limitation to the border. And so we reacted by using the issue in these recommendations, which we hope that TSOs and, and NRAs will follow, whereby we try to change the paradigm. We're not asking them to do anything abrupt, because some comments I've heard is, oh, you know, the light will go on. No, we're just asking them to see the problem from a dis different perspective, to see the problem, to approach the problem from a internal market, whereby cross-border and internal interconnections should be treated at the same level and try to move, you know, it's, it's a shift in paradigm. In the end, not much may happen, but at least the right approach, the right methodological approach, the right frame of mind, mind we hope, will be established, the frame of mind which is in line with the internal market. So this is what we do. We're not changing the world, but we're trying to push for... Um, 
for reflections, for, 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 for changing paradigms, for changing starting points, I would say. In, in six years, we've issued around 150 acts, some, a few of them decisions, as I said, most of them um, um, uh, recommendation decisions. But this is the past. Let's look at the future. There is the energy union. We all know the five pillars. And uh, the energy union, when it came to the agency, there was um, the intention of the commission to strengthen the role of the agency to give additional responsibility, including some uh, uh, enforcement powers. Um, then on the 30th of November, uh, the, package came, the package came out with, with, uh, with uh, well, eight legislative proposals, um, proposals or action in a number of um, areas. And this, this chart, this, this slide, is my very personal interpretation of how um, the various areas on which the package, um, uh, where the package um, uh, proposed new new solutions, which are on the left-hand side, delivers the, um, the, the, the long-standing pillar of uh, the um, energy policy, of European energy policy. And you can actually read the whole package with the lens of, um, of the old pillars, and then you, you, you know, it's, it's quite easy to see how most of the measures there relate to one, two, or all three of um, um, efficiency, um, sustainability, security supply. Let's take the very, probably one of the most contentious issues at the moment, which is, um, or what I understand being one of the most contentious issues, which is the, um, the fact that um, adequacy assessments, resource adequacy assessments, will not be done at national level anymore in the proposal of the Commission, but it will have to have at least a regional, if not a European-wide um, perspective. Um, this touches upon some of the uh, more sensitive aspects of European policy, you know, energy mix, security supply has always been considered as, as a national prerogatives. But in an internal market, if you continue to do the assessment at national level, either you uh, miss something, i.e. the opportunity of taking advantage of resources on the other side of the board, and therefore you end up with a solution or with an outcome which is more costly, or you double count i.e. you rely too much on resources across the border, and then a situation may arise where uh, there is a tightening, tightening conditions um, on, both, on both sides of the borders, and then you, know, you, you realize that every country has relied on its neighbor, and then you double count the, the resources. And this obviously endangers security supply. So the fact that you want to have a regional, if not a European-wide approach to resource assessment is, is delivering both efficiency and security supply. Uh, and as I said, most of what has been proposed can be, can be categorized or can be seen in this respect. But as I said, let's um, perhaps look at uh, what has been proposed and um, I give you my reaction to it. Um, and, and, and then we can have a discussion, uh, even though, as, uh, as I said, I'm uh, acutely aware that you, know, you have your evening, evening in front of us. Uh, just, just as an introduction, uh, as part of the reflection that we carried out uh, two years ago, and as already mentioned, we came up with um, incremental changes to the role of the agency, which would have been quite useful uh, to have. Um, not major things, but um, sufficient to introduce a more European-wide approach to regulation. For example, replacing national regulatory authorities when it comes to deciding on European-wide um, terms and conditions and methodology, the kind of detailed rules for the markets, rather than having, rather than uh, trying to seek unanimity among 28 NRAs within a six months seems just to be a good sense solution. And there were other, um, other sort of proposals of this kind, you know, you have a stronger European approach, you have to have stronger European network transmission um, system operators, and uh, since, NRA, uh, since TSOs are regulated at national level, you also want the European, the European network to be regulated at, or to be supervised at least at <laughs> European level. But as I said, let's look at the, at the winter package at a glance, let's see at the, which dimensions, and then I will comment on, 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 on each of these points. Uh, in the material which I will leave behind, you also have other slides with, uh, with a very detailed um, 
dealing with, with each of, of these points, but I think these are sufficient to give a bit of perspective. These are the main, um, well, most of the important changes that the um, Commission is proposing for, for, for the internal market uh, in electricity. And as I said, you know, the, the, the package is mostly in electricity, but the, the challenge for making the electricity system more flexible also affects the gas sector, because part of this flexibility can be provided by the gas sector, but the gas sector has itself to become more flexible in order to provide the flexibility to the electricity sector. And some of the um, effort that the agency and I think collectively we've been put into the gas sector is to make it more flexible, more price response, responsive, try to, um, to, ma to, 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 to make capacity available also for short-term trading in a sector where traditionally most of the action was, was locked in long-term contracts. So let's go back. I've already mentioned you know, some improvements um, in the way in which um, um, the second bullet point in the way in which the third layer of regulation can be improved. Also, a more streamlined approach for network codes. We have an enhanced list of network codes, uh, including on-demand response, cyber security, and I think we, you know, we've learned enough over the last five years um, that the current system is a bit convoluted, and I think we can streamline it a, a bit. Um, we, we need to have a, um, a geographical structure of the sector which is not um, the legacy of uh, former political border, the, bid the bidding zone uh, for, the, for the market. At the moment, they are mostly following um, uh, political borders. Uh, you might have heard of some excitement at the moment between uh, uh, over the, um, the, 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 the joint uh, German, Luxembourgish, and Austrian um, uh, bidding zone. But I think there is, uh, you know, there are in some areas where bidding zones are very big, and there are other areas in which bidding zones are, are very are much much smaller. Now, there is not magic recipe, but I think. Bidding zones should be set on the basis of um, of the electrical reality, electrical geography. At the moment, the bidding zone review ends with an uh, a sort of an approval by all member states. And because this is rightly or wrongly perceived as a zero sum game, I think the chances that member states will be able to agree are not very high. So here, the, the Commission is proposing that the Commission itself. Will, will, will decide on the bidding zone review, um, having uh, sought or on the basis of methodology that the agency defines. I think this is an open issue whether it is really a political or more a technical issue. Uh, great excitement about the, as I said, the European adequacy assessment. I think I already said what I, what I think about it. I think there is no way that we can deliver um, uh, security of supply and efficiency if we continue to insist that at least the assessment is done at national level. Then the decision can probably, you know, the, the final decision can still probably be left at national level, but the assessment should not um, be done at national level. Um, risk preparedness, um, once you've identified um, the, you know, the, the, the where an assessment, uh, sorry, where capacity or resource adequacy problem may arise. You also want to have a system which is prepared to, to, to deal with the risk, and therefore, again, risk preparedness should be something which is uh, um, approached at European level. If it turns out that we need, from the um, assessment, that we need capacity markets, um, but I think the point needs to be proved, then, um, again, Efficiency requires that these capacity markets allow cross-border participation. Uh, at the moment, capacity markets have been developed purely on a national basis. There is no provision in general for cross-border participation. I think this must become the norm in order not to miss an opportunity for resources in, you know, in, in one jurisdiction to be able to be used uh, in another jurisdiction. Um, great, again, great excitement has been um, has developed all the, the ROCs, the regional operational centers. Uh, at the moment, you have uh, regional security uh, cooperation initiatives. To me, they're very similar. It's basically recognition that TSO should talk to each other and should, they should coordinate. Maybe not uh, in real time or close to real time, because that's where 
issues may require uh, immediate reaction. But up to close to real time, I think there is plenty of room for coordination uh, in capacity calculation, for example, in making capacity available for the market, uh, which needs to be formalized beyond the current voluntary initiatives. So I don't see a big deal, but obviously sometimes DSO, DSO see, sees differently. Finally, um, because we are trying to create flexibility also through engaging consumers, and because most of the new renewables are actually connected at distribution level, we need to involve DSOs in, in defining the rules for the internal market. Until now, this has been very, very difficult because DSO at European level are represented by four or five different associations, depending on how you count them. And sometimes they speak with one voice, sometimes they don't speak with one voice. And in any case, it's very difficult to have five different representations around the table for the same constituency. So the Commission is proposing, and I think is, um, is, is, is the right direction, to establish a, uh, a European DSO body. And um, we'll see how it works. Um, to me, the experience of the ENSOs has given us enough um, lessons um, in order to try to create an expert body, not something to represent interests. Because what we want are DSO technicians to sit around the table and advise on whether what has been written is, is, um, is also applicable to DSOs and to contribute the DSO's vision, but the technical visions to what has been written. I think sometimes ENSO E, they have suffered from the fact that they had a double role. On the one hand, they have there are a members' organisation, therefore somehow they have to promote the interests of the members. But they're also part of this European uh, rulemaking process, where they are supposed to um, to, to participate as as uh, neutral uh, technicians. Let's see if um, going forward, both ENSO, the ENSOs and the DSO entity will be able to work well together. Um, just something that only relates to us, which is the possibility for the agency to actually issue um, recommendations or uh, opinion on our own initiative, uh, something at the moment we are generally prevented. So at the moment, unless somebody asks us a question, we can talk. And I think that, um, as I said, with, um, with more and more sensitive issues and more and more complex market design, I think it's better if the Europe a European regulatory agency is able to talk even if we're not asked because sometimes no one wants to ask the difficult question, but we are quite happy to answer difficult questions. So thanks a lot. As I said, I'll, be, I'll leave behind um, the rest of the presentation where each of these bullet points is elaborated in some details. Um, I mentioned that the Commission proposed to give the agency some enforcement power. Well, they forgot once they wrote, wrote the, somehow it didn't make the final text. As uh, it didn't make the final text uh, the possibility for the agencies to raise fees, because at the moment we are still financed by the EU budget, which for us is a great honor, but sometimes the EU budget has other constraints. So sometimes it's difficult to reconcile um, you know, the, the needs of the sector with the wider um, uh, financial policy of the European Union. Thank you very much. As I said, a great honor. <laughs> Muchas gracias, Alberto, por esta magnífica presentación y por estar en tiempo. Eh, ¿Alguien tiene alguna pregunta? Maite. ¿Tienes información acerca de cómo se va a desarrollar esta European Union DCO Entity? Sí. Dado que lo comentábamos, tiene muchas más dificultades que con los TSO para configurar ENSO, ENSO porque DCOs hay muchos más, bueno, distributos hay muchos más y además son de diferente perfil institucional. Eh, contamos ahora en Alemania hay propiedad de las municipalidades, hay distribuidores de gran y pequeña dimensión, ¿Cómo se va a configurar finalmente esto? Si es que tienes la información. Um, my... Yes, yes. 
Ir laiks. My personal view. My, maybe my personal view. Okay. Yes. Uh, it, it's still early days, because first we have to see whether this proposal can fly. Um, now, it's true. I mean, it's a more complex world. There are around 2,500 um, DSOs. Only 10%, roughly, of them are unbundled, which means they are big enough. Um, so you, 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 we are dealing with a very diverse world. But that, in a sense, helps to an extent, because as I, as, as I mentioned, my, per, my very personal view, and this is not the view of the agency, my very personal view is that we should try to find, to, you know, the aim should be to establish a technical body. The aim is to put DSOs into the rule-making uh, process. And what you want there is somebody who is able to say what is feasible, what is not feasible, what is required, for example, for integrating um, um, the new renewables, to allow demand response, to allow aggregation at, the, at um, DSO level. So it's true that also it's sometimes it's difficult to distinguish between the very technical and the, the interest of the, various, um, of the various components of this very varied world. But I think if we stay on the technical level, I think probably we will, you know, if we take this as, 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 as the guideline to, for, for the new body, I think we will avoid some of the problems that we've seen with, uh, with, uh, with ENSOE uh, and with ENSO. They are double role as technical body, but also as members' associations, which have somehow you know, to represent the interests of members. Um, but it's too early. Yeah. But that, this is just my personal. Bien, si no hay ninguna otra intervención, pues muchísimas gracias a todos ustedes, muchísimas gracias. Les emplazo para el año que viene eh, y siguiendo con la labor que está haciendo FUNSEAN, pues estoy convencido que el año que viene tendremos muchos más temas encima de la mesa, igual de interesantes que los de este año. Muchísimas gracias. gracias.